so much for that offertory. It's more than just the name of a song. It is well with my soul. It can be. You can experience the truth of that this morning. Thank you so much, Patty. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as you're turning into your scriptures this morning, 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. absence of Pastor Foster, some of our people today threw me back into the old uh, system of things, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, everything, leading the choir, the, the whole works in between. I, I wish I could say I miss doing it all, but I'm certainly glad for the good help that God has sent our way. I'm glad for them to be able to get away, too. They have uh, family members. Uh, Bonnie has uh, brother and family coming to the ranch the same week. They'll get to see them. Has a sister that lives at the ranch all the time. So they'll have a bit of a three-way family reunion there with uh, at least the Flanders uh, side of, of the family and have many, many, many fond uh, memories and blessings connected with the Bill Rice Ranch. First Corinthians chapter 11, you find your, your places in your, your scripture. We're going to take off and read a, a pretty sizable portion of uh, the 11th chapter, beginning in the 17th verse, when you find 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look down to the 17th verse, about midway through, almost exactly midway through the, the portion. Pick up reading with the 17th verse. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every man taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the cup, or this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I am come. And let's pray. Father, would you... Unlock the pages of your scripture. We know the lock has not been placed by you. It's been placed by the hardness of our heart, by the insensitivity of our souls. So, Lord, would you just give us illumination by the Spirit of God? Would you give us help and aid as, as we break the word of truth to these, our friends? And, Father, would you cause disturbances and distractions to move handily off to one side so that they not interfere with the principal thing that is receiving the truth that you have deposited in your word for us together this morning. Lord, we need a blessing. We need to be a blessing. We ask that you'll accomplish that in your good way. 
but you hide us behind the cross of Christ so that others may be pointed to Christ and your truths uh, through this message. We thank you for all that you're doing. Give us sheltering and help uh, from the evil one, from any of his distractions or diversions this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we were to title our message this morning, it would simply be when, <clears throat> when you come together, when you come together. That's a key phrase in the text that we read uh, from the scripture this morning in these uh, verses in the, the last part of, of chapter number 11. In fact, it is found five times in the immediate passage that we read. I hope that you're not going back to verify that they're there. They are. Uh, you can take my word for it. And you can certainly verify that later if you want to go back and study more in depth in this passage. And by the way, I hope that sometimes our Sunday morning message will do that for you. It will whet your appetite so that you can see something and you go back and say, I've got to look at that carefully again. Or maybe, is he really telling us the truth about that? And you're driven back to the Word of God. You know, that's a good thing when somebody preaches and when you, uh, when you examine the truth of what is preached by the truth of God's Word. That's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? And we're supposed to let God's word uh, be the, the, the final word. And now it's, it's possible for this preacher to misspeak or even to say wrong things that are not right. Now, I wouldn't do it intentionally, but it's possible. It can happen to any of us. Uh, but we certainly have faith in the integrity of God's word that we have clearly given to us and before us. And so let's, uh, if we could, allow the, the word of God uh, some space to, uh, to ruminate in our hearts. Now what's it mean to ruminate? Anybody know? What is a, did you know there's kind of an animal, this class of animals, they are ruminants? Ruminants? Cow's one of them. You know what ruminants do? They chew their cud. Okay, now I'm not trying to be gross, but it's really true. Uh, to ruminate is to go back over. Again, and it's good for, for Christians that come to church to, to ruminate to go back and to rehash and to redigest and to process again the Word of God. Now, if, you know, if we can come to church and we can hear a good message, oh, that's a good message, you know, God really used that message, what a wonderful truth that is, and we go our ways and that's the end of it, and that's all there is to it. Well, there may be some residual value to that, but, you know, if we go our ways and that keeps reverberating later in the day, throughout the week, maybe later for our whole lives, some truths that spring from God's Word. Uh, that's really valuable, isn't it? When we have an encounter with God and when His Word uh, bears fruit in some um, progressive. I don't like the word progressive. I don't like progressive politicians. I don't like progressive. I like progressive dinners. That's a good thing. But progressive things in, in other senses I don't like, but we like to see the progressive work. That is, it continues, it moves on, it moves forward. Now, much of what is billed as progressive today is not pro progressive, it's regressive. It's going the wrong direction. It's taking us back to some place that we'd rather not go. But anyway, we want God's word to be in the right sense of the word progressive and to produce something valuable and useful and instrument in our lives. So when, when we think of this, when you come together, it's found five times in, in the immediate passage and and Paul belabors the fact perhaps and it's uh, just in the passage that we that we just now read but what's he speaking of when he when he speaks about when ye come together when you come together well he's speaking of the meeting of the church clearly meeting of the church body that is the local body that is the only church body that the Corinthians were concerned about now they knew about some others uh, but uh, I agree with Pastor Foster wholeheartedly in this he recently said this uh, when we see in the scripture of the church uh, the church of church he's speaking about a church an individual local church and when we get off into speaking of, of some giant body that exists somewhere out in in uh, in time or eternity somewhere but it's never been together uh, I know that there is is a truth related to that uh, in, in the big picture in God's word. But when he's speaking to the church, he's speaking to us right here. You and me, that's us. That's us and us. Now, that's those of us that, that are under the sound of my voice and that come together and that congregate together. Hence the usage of the word, when ye come together, when you come together, it is the meeting of the body together. And this verse 17 that we read uh, records not only the condition that existed at uh, Corinth 
uh, in the 17th verse, if you'd just like to look at that once again. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not for uh, that you come together, not for the better, but for, for the worse. Now, isn't that a, a sad conclusion to draw? When you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Boy, that doesn't sound like what's supposed to happen when you go to church, does it? When you come to church, you're not supposed to, to go away worse off than when you came. Really, you're supposed to gain something, aren't you? Now, I, I do know that, that sinners should be convicted. And that's lost sinners and saved sinners. When people come to church without Jesus Christ, uh, they should experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God that should drive them to repentance and faith in Christ so they can trust the Lord Jesus and receive his, his free gospel uh, as their very own. And so th there could be some discomfort connected with that. I know that. And have, have you as a believer, as a Christian, have you ever experienced conviction where Man, that was a tough service. That was a tough message to hear. Have you? I have. There, there have some, been some where I couldn't say, Amen, brother, Amen. I'd have to say, Oh, me. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> That's me. That's me, oh, Lord. Standing in need of the prayers, the old uh, spiritual says. Uh, but here, here was the situation at, at Corinth. Uh, they were coming to church, and Paul says, when you come together, you're not coming together for the, for the better, but for, for the worse. Now, what was the reason behind that? Well, you don't have to look far to answer that question from the passage here in 1 Corinthians 11. It's, it's answered there in verse number 18. And it's, it's clearly seen, 18th verse, uh, for first of all, he said, you want to know why? Well, here it is. Number one, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. You know why I partly believed it? Because it was true. He'd heard about it. Message has been carried to him. It was verified. He knew that was true. He said, when you come together, and part of the reason is because there are divisions among you. Now, this is not a new occurrence. In fact, it's not the first time that this subject has been breached in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's found early in the book. If you'll turn backwards a few pages, if you can, to uh, chapter 3 and verse 3. Uh, Paul begins uh, early in his discourse in his letter to the to the Corinthian believers in chapter three and verse three says, for ye are yet carnal for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? And so he takes up this subject earlier and again it's revisited now in the 18th verse. And he says uh, there, there are divisions. I hear that there be divisions among you. Now no, there's another word that is, is used uh, for, for divisions and it, it is a word that <clears throat> we could call uh, schisms. Schisms. Now that's kind of a funny word. It's used sometimes in, in English. It, it comes directly over from one of the original languages of the scripture, but it, it actually means to cut <laughs> with scissors. It means there are, are divisions, there are cuts, there are, are separations uh, uh, among you. Now this is not speaking of separations in, in the right sense. I am a biblical separatist. I think there's some things we need to separate ourselves from clearly, uh, wrong and, and sinful things. It's not what we're speaking of here. We're talking about divisions, cuts, rents, schisms within the local body that shouldn't be there. Now cuts and, and divisions are wonderful things where they're supposed to be, but where they're not supposed to be, then they're not good things because they don't produce anything useful. It's like one night we were out shrimping. I used to go out shrimping when I was of not as sound a mind as I am now. You'd, you go out just at sunset and you stake out your place over at Oak Hill and you, 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 uh, you find out where you're going to go and you and get your nets out and your lights and all the stuff and you find your batteries are dead and all the rest of that stuff. But anyway, one night we're out there shrimping and man, the shrimp are running like crazy. It's just like crazy and, and we're, we're just dipping, 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 dipping and uh, I bring my net up for a, uh, I think it's a great load of shrimp and I say, whoa. Not a single shrimp. Well, guess what? There was a schism in the bottom of my net. There was a rent. There was a hole. And the shrimp were just shrimp swimming through my net. And it wasn't getting anything as far as the, the overall mission of, of the night. Now, that's a silly thing. But did you know that our churches are like that? We've got tears and divisions and rents and schisms where they ought not be. And they're killing us. 
the hurting is. Paul says it existed in the church at, at Corinth. It was not a new problem. It was there from, from the beginning. Uh, it is because, thinking back to this uh, first part in chapter 3, it's because uh, the believers were not spiritual, but, but carnal. Not spiritual, but carnal. Now, early in the book of Corinthians, there are three categories of people that are outlined clearly in Scripture. This is Bible teaching. This is not some harebrained idea that I have, uh, but there, there are three categories. Now, we know that, strictly speaking, there are only two categories of people in the world, saved and lost, right? Some have said the saints and the ain'ts. Those that have Christ Jesus as Savior and those that need Him. Those that are lost, there are, there are two categories. But in Paul's dealing with the Corinthians, he needed to include a second class within the believers. And so he, he did. Uh, there are those that are lost, which he refers to as the natural man. The natural man receiveth not things of the spirit. He can't because he's without Christ. Uh, that's the natural man, the lost man who is unsaved. But within the body of Christ, within uh, the realm of those who are truly saved, those who have uh, placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, there would be two categories and that would be spiritual and carnal. And again, I don't want to oversimplify this and I don't want to offend you, but I do realize that there is territory between the two classifications of spiritual and carnal or else we would have to uh, go to a false doc doctrine of instantaneous sanctification where bang you get it and you're all of a sudden spiritual no we know that it's there's a learning curve and there's a growth process in this Christian life isn't there isn't there you, you understand where I'm headed with this there's learning there's growth uh, you don't get it all at once now you get saved all at once uh, but then you you learn how to deal with our lives and the way that we live some have habits and vices and, and, and bad things that they deal with and, and some struggle intensely with those things and some are a long time dealing with them and in fact some of them never deal with them which prompts you to say well I don't think he's really saved because he still does such and such. Well that's not fair for us to say uh, but I, I do know there is some territory between spiritual and, and carnal but let's just outline if we could uh, what Paul's dealing with with the Corinthian believers when he says when you come together it's for the worse not for the better. He almost could be saying this you'd be better off not to go to church. <laughs> now if you're looking for an excuse not to go to church don't seize on that one okay because he's not saying that he's not advocating that. It's always better if we get to church. It's always, and it's always much better if we can come with the right heart and the right mind and with openness so, so the Spirit of God can resonate uh, with the truth that is being given. But back to our two categories, there's is carnal and, and spiritual. Now, assuming that uh, a person is saved, uh, there would be two things, two terms that Paul uses to describe, and they are, uh, they are, are sort of opposites. They're on opposite extremes of, of where people are, and it's not always a function of time. Now you might think, well, somebody's been saved for 50 years, so obviously they're spiritual, right? Well, they should be. After 50 years in Christ, or after being saved for a number of years, there should be spiritual development, shouldn't there? There should be maturity. Wouldn't we expect that? Wouldn't that be normal? Wouldn't you expect that when a baby is born and, and grows for 50 years, wouldn't you expect there would be some physical maturity and development and, and growth? Well, sure, and so we would spiritually as well. But it is not synonymous with uh, time that has passed because there are some people that get saved, I don't doubt that they're saved, and they come to church and sit for years and years and years, and so it up like the sponge that we talked about in Sunday school this morning and, and yet are, are still babes in Christ because they've not progressed, they've not grown in, in knowledge and they've not uh, gone from grace to grace and from faith to faith. Uh, they've not developed in Christ and so they're still carnal. Let me mention this about spirit, about carnality if, if I could. Uh, carnality is a normal condition for a baby Christian. It's a normal condition for someone who has just been saved. Uh, you just trust Christ. You perhaps have no background or no knowledge. We expect a brand new baby Christian to be carnal because they've never grown. They've never learned. They've never developed. It's just like there's a striking parallel to this with physical development, if we would. Uh, now, just about now, uh, 
Philip H. and Pastor and Mrs. Foster and Sharon Rush were the adults that are along on the trip to the ranch. They're experiencing some of the joys of having juniors along for a whole week. And they're going through this mental process. They're thinking this is Sunday, Sunday morning. It's just coming up on Sunday noon. We've got Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and all day Saturday and late Saturday night we'll be back. I've got to put up with this all week long. Do you know why juniors act like juniors? Because they're juniors. Do you know that? Do you know why they, you know why they aggravate you to death and ask the dumbest questions? Because they're, they're junior kids. That's the way they are. We expect that. Do you know why they're, they're messy? Do you know why they break things? Do you know why they get lost? Uh, why they, why they, they mess up? Because that's what they do. We expect that. Now sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's humorous. Sometimes it's pitiful and pathetic. Uh, but we, we expect that of, of babies. Do you know why babies cry and demand their rights all the time, right away on, on their schedule? Because that's what we expect of, of babies. Isn't that a normal condition as kids grow up? You know, uh, when, when some of us uh, senior aged uh, adults get a few years on us, it's, it's common for us to lose patience with kids. Just absolutely lose patience, not have any patience whatsoever. We ought not do that. We ought not do it, grandparents, great grandparents. Great, great grandparents, we shouldn't do that because we were just like that one time. We were. And they need the love and the, the attention and the understanding and the help and the instruction of older people that are not fuddy duddies. Now, you don't have to mess up and be as crazy as they are. Uh, you, you can't do that. You know, it's been said that when you work with young people, if you work with young people, it'll keep you young. But if you try to stay up with them and do the things that they do, that'll kill you young. <laughs> You'll, you'll die early if you try to do that. So I, I guess some of our folks this week are trying to keep up with them. But now that's the counterpart physically. You know why the kids act like that? Because they're kids. We expect that. We give them room to mess up and to make mistakes. Uh, we don't want to get to see them injured. We don't want to see them morally scarred in the process of doing that. And we guard against that, don't we? There are things that are built in to prevent that. Some, some rules and, and regulations that are designed to protect protect those little guys, uh, but they act like the kids because they are kids. They are. And so when we look at these two descriptions scripturally of carnal and spiritual, we understand that when, when you get born in the family of Christ, you come in as a brand new born babe in Christ, uh, desiring the sincere milk of the word, the easy, simple things that can be, uh, can be taken and, and digested and uh, can profit and benefit you greatly. And then you build upon that and you go on through a process called sanctification to maturity, uh, aiming toward the matter of being a spiritual Christian. So you're, you're carnal when you start out. And again, the, the progress that takes place varies from individuals. It's never the same for any two people. Now, sometimes you'll see p patterns and parallels in a, in a married couple and some different things because they're traveling together and so forth. Uh, but there are some people that just take off and, and grow uh, enormously and they grow intensely, uh, rapidly. Uh, they, they go. And others just seem, seem to have difficulty assimilating some of the truths and, and getting with the program. And so there's these differences. But uh, all that being said, uh, we're headed on a journey toward the matter of, of spirituality. And that is the, the spiritual Christian is, is one who doesn't act like a baby in Christ who doesn't always demand his way right away, uh, who has some perception and some understanding. You know, it's amazing the difference between adults and, and kids and young people. Have you ever sent your kid, I'll just use this to illustrate and you'll understand it, but it has a, a value spiritually. Have you ever sent your kid looking for something in the other room and they came back and say, it's not in there, it's not in there, I can't find it. And you walk into the room and it's in plain view. It's right there. Because adults have different ways of looking at things. We scan the whole room. You have ways of looking around and processing a lot of things in front of you and digesting that and saying, bang, there it is. Kids don't do that. They say, I don't know where it is. It's not there. Okay? Well, that's true spiritually. And when, when we grow from, from carnal to spiritual, you can take some brand new Christians and say, 
Well, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world I ever heard. I have no idea why in the world they do that. And yet someone who has, has looked at some truths from God's Word and has been down the road a little bit and they say, well, I understand exactly what the purpose of that is. I really do. That's the difference between carnal and spiritual. You've got some experience, some learning, and you're, you're getting toward that category. And for ease of, of uh, treatment and, and argument in, in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, he uses carnal, babes in Christ, or spiritual. He said, I'd like to speak to you spiritual, but I, but I can't, because you're babes in Christ. I'd like to give you some heavy-duty meat of the Word, but I can't do it because you're not able to bear it just now. I've got to go back and give you some spiritual milk, milk of, of the Word. Now, spiritual milk is good for those that are developing, uh, but the idea is we ought to be progressing down the road toward spiritual maturity, becoming spiritual Christians. Now, when we see in this immediate context that the problem lies clearly in the church at Corinth between uh, carnal Christians and spiritual. It brings us to the, to the context of chapter 11, and it is clearly the Lord's table. You, you saw that uh, because I included intentionally in the reading the passage that we read frequently on Sundays when we uh, serve the Lord's table together. And uh, that, that is, is the context. Well, some things were, were happening in a, in a real uh, offensive and bad way in, in Corinth. They were having a, a lot of rivalry and dissension and, and uh, divisions around the Lord's table. Now, it wasn't just as, as we have uh, symbolic elements, but rather what we have is a response to what, what happened to them. What they were doing was having elaborate feasts. And, uh, you know, we, we have some, some fancy get-togethers in our church sometimes where we uh, bring out the, the linen tablecloths and, and everything, and, and we do it up nice for certain occasions and so forth. And, and that's good uh, for us to, to do that. But, you know, they were putting on the dog, but there became a, a rivalry, a contention, a division, because people were trying to impress and trying to, to, to put on the spread and impress some of the poor people that didn't even have food to eat hardly. And they were bringing their meager fare, and this was causing divisions and contention among them. And it's sadly stated around uh, the celebrating of the Lord's table together. Well, part of the reason, perhaps you've wondered this, is that why, why in the world when we have communion, the Lord's table, why do you have that little old piece of cracker, a little piece of bread, and a little bitty miniature cup that doesn't do any good to anything? Uh, it's intentionally intentionally that way so that we're reminded it's symbolic and it's attached to a bigger truth than just eating and drinking. It's not that. It isn't. And it's partly a response from wrong treatment of the Corinthian believers and it's partly because of our human nature that we still possess and it's partly to uh, in, engender in us the right attitude toward coming toward the Lord's table. This vehicle conveys the areas where the divisions are clearly demonstrated. They're clearly seen in the Corinthian church, and they perhaps can be somewhat clearly identified in, in our presence, in our midst. And since the schisms, the divisions, the rents, uh, those things ought not be, but they are. Uh, we will be reminded that they are often connected to our human practices that are tied uh, to fleshly indulgences or fleshly enjoyment at times. And, and those things drive the spiritual rather than the spiritual driving those things. Now think of this for a moment. We said there are spiritual Christians and carnal Christians. Carnal Christians are most likely be driven by what they want, their desires, uh, what's good to eat, uh, how they can have a good time, uh, social activity, so forth. That's, that's really a hallmark of a, a carnal existence. Now, it's not wrong to go out to eat, and it's not wrong to have a youth activity. It's not wrong to go off to summer camp and spend a lot of time and money and effort doing that. But there's a matter of spiritual balance to all of that. If it's all we ever do, then we're missing the boat, aren't we? We've missed it. There are other things. There are spiritual exercises. And so the, the person, and I'm trying to use the extremes to illustrate this, uh, if 
uh, if the person is carnal and they tend to respond only to the carnal things, the fleshly things, uh, even if they're not sinful, but they, they cater to our own desires, uh, that's the way that's going to be. It will grade against those perhaps who are more spiritually mature. Now, it's, it's just like this. You've been saved for 157 years and you'd be happy to go out and pass out John and Romans and uh, be out for, for special activities and different things uh, and spiritual activities, serious things from now on and forget all that fun stuff. Well, that, that would be perhaps the view of the spiritual, but uh, you as a spiritually mature person would have to consider we're dealing also with some that aren't. And they have needs. They have some legitimate needs and concern. And they're on a journey. They're on a path of development at the same time. And as there's consideration and as there's understanding uh, the one for the other, we see those schisms healed within the body of Christ. It's strange to observe that the Corinthian church was probably the most gifted church of any church recorded in the scripture. There were more people that had Holy Spirit gifts. You know, I was interested a while ago, we sang that, that other version of uh, Oh Happy Day. Now, that's not the music that you're used to. Uh, you're, you're used to the old version of Oh Happy Day. Oh Happy Day that fixed my choice on thee my Savior and my God. Same words but a different tune. But we're singing that and down in the chorus of Hallelujah. I was thinking, whoa, we got a church full of Baptists saying Hallelujah. That's almost a dangerous thing. They might like that. What if we get a church and they just start saying hallelujah all the time? Well, that'd be a good thing too if it was real, wouldn't it? Sure would. I don't know what I was using that illustration for. I got to back it back into the, to the main point uh, if, if, if we could. But as, as we think of, of this truth of spiritual gifts, of Holy Spirit gifts within the church, the Corinthians possessed more than any church recorded in Scripture. There were people that had unusual gifts of tongues and prophecy and discernment and sign gifts, by the way, that God has placed aside for, for the moment. He, he can, if he chooses, give them. He's, he's God. He can do what he wants to. Uh, but we know that he's replaced them with something complete and perfect. And that's the word of God that we have. And we, we need nothing more than thus saith the Lord uh, for, for now. But uh, yet what was happening in the church at Corinth, they had people that were in rivalry and competition concerning the gifts that they had. Some would say, I can speak more tongues than you can. And they were flaunting this and they were throwing this around and throwing that around. And even though there were legitimate gifted areas that they possessed from God, it became an issue of rivalry and contention and of splitting rather than an advancing of the purpose of God in, in their midst. And so all that said reminds us of the fact that Paul says there are divisions among you and I partly believe it. Now all that's true about them, but I would like for us to bring that down to the 21st century to us. If it was true in the early days of Christianity, isn't it ever so true today? And need we not keep an eternal vigil for the same thing, not manufacture things or not imagine differences and difficulties within the church, but be aware to and responsive to those and be cognizant of the fact uh, that we're dealing with, with people with great spiritual maturity and advanced maturity in our churches and others uh, that are babes in Christ that don't understand anything at all. I mentioned in passing to our Sunday school class this morning that the responsibility of a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or one who speaks uh, to, to a group, Brother Farrell can understand this completely. Uh, you know, I can stand up and say, well, you remember that story about Enoch? His name came up in Sunday school this morning. You remember the story about Enoch? What happened to Enoch walking with God and he was not because God took him and everything? If I just talk about that, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And others say, Enoch? Enoch who? I don't know anything about Enoch. And so I'm talking about some people that know more than I do and some people that know hardly anything at all. And so you can't just flip things out there and assume that everything is, is communicating on the, on the right uh, 
uh, level with, with, with everybody. So we must be cognizant of the fact that we have multiple people at all kinds of different points of development along the way. And uh, we, we ought to give a, a diet of the Word of God, which uh, would be some new things that some people see for the very first time. And some others would, would say, uh, well, I've heard that uh, uh, 300 times. I've heard messages all my life uh, about that. And I, I really, really understand that. Well, if you do, praise God. I'm thankful that, that you do. And by the way, you know, if we are mature Christians, we ought not ever be offended at the teaching and preaching of God's word. We ought not ever be offended by, by that, even at the simplicity of God's word. Now, if, if you look down your nose at somebody because you know, that's, that's so basic and that's so juvenile, so basic, if, if that's your response, then you're actually showing spiritual immaturity rather than the love of, of, of God's word. There's a need for preaching at all kinds of different levels, isn't there? Oh, we could get up here and talk about dispensational theology and about uh, replacement theology and all kinds of things. And I'd love to talk about a bunch of those things. We could get up here and talk about Bible versions, how God blessed us with his word in the English and the King James. And, and I could support that wonderfully and give you all kinds of stuff. But... You know, we're not out to impress anybody, not out to, to make any brownie points with anybody, trying to convey the truth and the value and the wonderful, uh, the wonderful miracle of, of God's giving to us uh, what he wants for us and how that we can take readily uh, for our use the precious word of God. Well, when you come together, when you come together, that's the theme, that's the title of the message but I'd like for you to ask a couple of questions of yourself. When you come together, how are things? Was it better before you came or after you came? Or is anything happening while you're here? Or do you uh, get out of shape and been out of shape with somebody because you are here because of their immaturity or your superiority and uh, short on patience because of that? Well, these things, brethren, ought not to be according to God's word. Uh, let us sweetly submit to the spirit of God's working and let us in the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace be drawn together in the body of Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We'll pray in just a moment. Thank you for your, your good attention this morning. Uh,